Today we celebrate the final Sunday in the church's year, which means the church's new year begins next week with the beginning of Advent. And so as we celebrate the final week of the year, we also then hear about the things that are going to happen at the end of the world, because the end of the church year is upon us. And so right now we're living in a time where lots and lots of people, number one, are filled with fear, but number two, seem to think that the end of the world is upon us. It is not. But nonetheless, I do believe that we are at the end of an era. And that's the part that we then need to look at in the readings today to be able to see exactly what our Lord is telling us. So first of all, you will notice that all of the things that he talks about when it comes to the end of the reading, he says that all these things will happen in this generation. This generation will not pass away till all these things have, been, have occurred. Now we look at it and say, well, he spoke 2,000 years ago. What does he mean by this generation will not pass away if all these things haven't happened yet? They did. It wasn't the end of the world. It was the end of an era. In the year 70, before that generation passed away, all these things took place that the Lord had spoken of. There were the signs in the sky. There were the horrible things that were happening. He told the people, as we heard, when you see this happening, flee from Jerusalem, get to the mountains. It's exactly what the people did. Remember when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70, over one million Jewish people were killed. Not one single Christian was killed. That wasn't because the Romans went through and asked the question, are you a Christian? Oh, well, you go on this side. And are you a Jew? Well, you go over here then. No, it's because the Christians had fled. They knew what our Lord had told them, and they headed out to the mountains. It was right before that time that the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse was given. And that's exactly what the historians talk about. It's because of the vision, they said. That's all that they say. It's because of the vision the Christians all left. St. John had received that vision from our Lord. He wrote it down in the book, in the book of Revelation. And when the people heard it, they recognized exactly what Jesus had been talking about. And they fled Jerusalem and got out, headed for the hills. So for us, now we need to be able to look at what the church gives us on this day. First of all, we look at what St. Paul talks about. So again, what the church is doing is trying to set us up for success here and trying to tell us what it is that we're going to need. So St. Paul, Praise that God will fill us with all the knowledge of God's will and spiritual wisdom and understanding. So in other words, don't get all worked up about all the things that are going on on the natural level. It's something that I'm hearing about an awful lot from people. I'm so angry about what's happening in the world and in the church. Why? These things need to happen. The thing that I keep pointing out is, look, if the apostles would have understood, which of course there was no way they could have, but if they could have understood what was going on with the Lord's passion and what was going to be happening to Jesus and why, they would have handled it very differently. But they couldn't have understood. Even though Jesus told them what was going to happen, they didn't really have a context to understand it. And so they all panicked and they all ran away and all the different things that happened. We all know what happened. But if they would have understood, there would have actually been a point of rejoicing. Not rejoicing that Jesus was suffering, rejoicing that God's will was being done and our salvation was being brought about. Well, that's what St. Paul is praying for, that we will have the knowledge of God's will that we will have spiritual wisdom and understanding. So number one, look what he's asking for, that we will be able to see things from a spiritual perspective, not just on the natural level. 
So I keep telling people, yeah, don't bury your head in the sand. Acknowledge what's going on. It's evil. It is rotten to the core. But why get angry about it? What good's it going to do? So we need to recognize, yes, these are evil times that we're living in, and these things that are happening are horrible. They need to happen. If the church is going to be crucified, then let's apply what we already know from 2,000 years of saints and theology. We can look back and say, well, of course these things had to happen to Jesus. Look at what the Old Testament tells us. Look at what he was doing and why he was doing it. This is the end of an era. The church is going to be crucified. These things have to happen. It is a necessity. We don't need to panic. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to be all worked up. We need to see it spiritually. Why is this happening? Because the church is going to consummate her marriage to her bride, to, to her, her husband, just as he consummated his marriage to his bride 2,000 years ago on the cross. The church is going to, to, to consummate her marriage to him on the cross. It needs to happen. So we can apply the exact same principles that we now know that the apostles couldn't have understood, but we supposedly do. Then let's apply the principles. So you look at it and you say, okay, the church is going to be crucified. Who did this to Jesus 2,000 years ago? Hmm high priests. And who did they use? The government. Well, isn't that amazing? Look what's happening in the church right now. And look what's happening in the world right now. And how do you think this is all going to work out? Well, the high priests are the ones who are going to turn the church over. And the government is the one who will destroy it. It needs to happen. So when you see these things happen, Jesus didn't say get angry. He didn't say panic. He said get out. It doesn't mean get out of the church. It means let it fall. Get out of the way. This needs to happen. Because this is an end of an era. Just as what happened in the year 70 was the end of an era, so now what is happening in our time is the end of an era. It's not the end of the world yet. That's way up the road. But this is the end of an era. And so these things that our Lord speaks about are going to happen. Not in their fullness. That will happen only at the end of the world. But very similar things, just as what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago in the year 70, right before the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So when we look around and we listen to what's going on, we hear all kinds of people telling us that it's the end of the world because the signs are there. The signs are indeed there. And so there are lots of non-Catholics who are telling you that the end has come. No, it hasn't. But we're going to have to deal with things similarly to when the end comes. So there are some things that we can look at. First of all, our Lord tells us that when the second coming happens, it's going to happen like lightning coming across the sky. It's going to happen only after the time of tribulation, after the sun is darkened, after the moon no longer gives her light, after the stars fall from the sky. That's when the sign of the Son of Man is going to be given. So this idea that, well, Jesus is going to be here and he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years and so on, that's a heresy, by the way, called millennialism, that's not going to happen. But there are some that want you to believe that that's what's going to happen. There are the others who want to believe that this is the end of the world and we need to be ready for the end of the world. We need to understand what's going on. At the end of the world, as Jesus said, it will be a time unsurpassed in distress. The reason for that is twofold. First of all, 
as we see going on in our own day, this is a test of our faith. This is a test to see if we are going to remain faithful because we see the corruption in the church, we see all of the evil going on around us, and maybe some people are looking at it and saying, well, if God doesn't care, why should I? Or this clearly proves that there is no God or whatever goofy ideas people have. Yeah, just like the fact that Jesus was crucified proved that God is weak, that God doesn't exist, because how would he allow his son to do that? It's the reason his son came into the world was to do that. It proves the strength of God, not the weakness of God. But see, it depends on whether you're going to look at it from the natural perspective or from the spiritual perspective, which is why St. Paul is praying and the church gives us the reading to pray for spiritual insight, to be able to understand these things. And notice, too, that the church prays, as St. Paul does, that we will be given perfect patience and long-suffering, joyfully enduring, giving thanks to the Father. Long-suffering, it's not exactly an American trait these days. It's what's going to be necessary. When we look at the evil going on, we have to understand we're still just at the beginning. The train is just pulling out from the station and people are already in panic mode. We got a long way to go. And so we need patience and we need long suffering. And we see the reason why we need to be able to see things from a spiritual perspective. Because, as our Lord said, if the time were not shortened, even the elect would fall astray. Now we can expect that we're going to see some people being raised up who are going to be false prophets, who are going to be false Christ. The Lord talks about that. That's why he makes it clear. He's not going to simply be here and be raised up and have a kingdom and we can all say, oh, there he is. No, he said, when you see the signs in the sky, he's going to come escorted by his angels and he's going to come with, in the clouds and they're going to be in the trumpet blasts and all the different things. The Antichrist is going to have an earthly kingdom. He's going to reign in the world. That's not what Jesus is going to do. And so when this clown is raised up and he tries to tell us that he's the Christ and he's going to be able to work miracles because he's going to have the power of Satan to be able to do it, people are going to be wowed. And oh, look at... He's great, he brings peace and he brings prosperity and all the wonderful things that he's doing that we haven't been able to do in all these thousands of years. It must be him. No, it's not. That's why we need to know what the signs are and what our Lord has warned us to watch for. Because, again, Things are going to be very similar in our day to what will happen when the end of the world comes. So we can look back to the year 70 and we can learn what happened back then because it's going to be similar to what will happen now. Yes, there are differences, obviously, but for the most part, it's going to be similar. When the end comes, it's going to be similar to what we're going to be dealing with now. So we can look for the same kinds of signs. So I mentioned that there are a couple of reasons why these things have to happen this way. Remember that purgatory ends on the last day of the world, which means that the people who are alive when the end of the world comes must be made perfect before the Lord comes. There is no time afterward for them to be perfected. That's why it will be a time unsurpassed in distress. That's why they're going to need to be purified completely. That's why their faith is going to be tested beyond what anybody's faith has ever been tested in the history of the world because they have to be perfect at that time. For you and me, 
yeah, as long as we're in the state of grace and we're on the way, yeah, we're, we can be in purgatory till the end of the world. Those people won't have that opportunity. Obviously, we can look back and we can see that we've got a lot less time in purgatory, perhaps, than somebody who died a thousand years ago. If they're going to be in purgatory till the end of the world, they've already been there for a thousand years. Well, we have to be more purified than that, if that's the case. That's why these things have to happen, to test our faith and to purify us, and, <laughs> excuse me, and to prepare us for what's to come. All this is going to lead, ultimately, to the resurrection of the Church, to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. That's what we're looking forward to. This is not an end in itself, but it is a time of testing because things have gotten so easy, so materialistic, that many of us have forgotten about God. Oh, we give him lip service and we show up for Mass on Sunday, but otherwise we basically live like we don't really need him. Or with the attitude, I can handle this myself, but I'll let you know when I need some help. Well, guess what? We need help every moment of every day. So we need to learn to be dependent on the Lord. We don't like that. We want to be independent. We want to be strong. We want to be in control. We're not. God is. So we need to learn to turn to Him and to be dependent on Him. So we're going to try to do it ourselves. We're going to fall. And we're going to deny Him and we're going to walk away. We're going to look around and say, if God is allowing all of this, he can't be a loving God. How can this happen? We come up with the most ridiculous and foolish things when we're suffering. And suffer we will. So we need to be prepared. That's why the church is giving us these things. But it is now more relevant for us than it has been for any other Christians since the year 70 because this is going to be fulfilled in a profound way in our day. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next week. It's a process. It's beginning. But it's going to happen. And so we need to understand that. We need to have the spiritual insight. We need to prepare ourselves spiritually. We need to be ready. And we need to make sure that the prayer life is in order, because without the prayer life, we cannot do this. That's what we have to be clear about. Keep our focus where it belongs. Don't worry about what's going on. Is the church filled with corrupt people? Absolutely. Is the world filled with corrupt people? Absolutely. Acknowledge it. Don't worry about it. It needs to happen. The church isn't going to fall and be crucified because she was filled with saints. If that were the case, we'd be in wonderful shape right now. If the world were filled with saints, it wouldn't be an evil place right now. But again, read the scriptures. The world isn't going to end because it was so good. The world is going to end because it became so evil. So when we see these things happening, understand that they must. Remember what Jesus said when he appeared to his disciples along the road to, to Emmaus? Was it not necessary that the Messiah must undergo these things? It is necessary that the church must undergo these things. And we have the absolute privilege, and you can only understand that if you're seeing it spiritually, to be alive in these days, to be part of this, to be chosen by God, to be among those who will be alive when the church is crucified. This is the greatest time in the history of the world to be a saint. It is the greatest time in the history of the world to be alive. It sure doesn't look like it on the surface. If we look at it naturally, yeah, it's a disaster. Pray for the grace to see things with spiritual eyes, 
to have spiritual wisdom and insight as the Church is asking us to do and what St. Paul was praying for so that we can remain faithful to the end, so that we will not abandon our Lord, that we will not turn our back, that we will not doubt because all these things are happening, because they are necessary. They need to happen in order to bring us to the purification, the crucifixion of the Church, in order to bring us to the resurrection, to the triumph of our Blessed Lady's Immaculate Heart.